Hello friends, subscribers and new viewers of this channel and welcome to Robotics and Mechatronics Tutorials. In this Robotics and Mechatronics Tutorial, we explain how to develop a complete feedback control system for controlling an angle of rotation of a DC motor by using an encoder and a PID controller. Here is a brief overview of the experimental setup and later on we will present the wiring diagram. We are using a low-cost DC motor with a Hall effect encoder. Here is the encoder. Over here you can see the close view of the motor. Here is the main shaft. The motor also has a gear reducer that's integrated together with the motor and on the back you can see the Hall effect encoder. The encoder is used to measure the angle of rotation of the motor shaft. Over here we 3D printed a pendulum and attached a pendulum to the main motor shaft. To control the motor we are using a low-cost motor driver. Here's the motor driver and Arduino Mega. The motor driver is attached to the motor and to the power supply that you can see over here. Over here you can see the main C++ file that's used to control the motor. We have developed several classes that are used to read the data from the encoder, control the motor driver and to implement the PID controller. We will explain all these classes later on in this video tutorial. Over here, we set the desired angle of rotation of the motor shaft. The angle of rotation is expressed in the encoder pulses. For the purpose of demonstration, we set the desired angle of the motor shaft to be 1500 pulses. This approximately corresponds to four revolutions of the main motor shaft. This is the reference signal, or better to say, the set point for our PID controller. Below you can see the PID control parameters. They are proportional gain of 4, the integral gain of 20, and derivative gain of 0.2. And over here you can see the discretization constant, or better to say, discretization time for discretizing our PID controller. Next. Let's upload the code and let's start the controller and let's see how the system will respond. And here we are. Good. Over here on the serial monitor you can see the final value of the control error that is the steady state control error expressed in encoder pulses we can see that the error is only a single pulse. This is a very small fraction of a degree. That is, we were able to very accurately position the main shaft of our motor. Now, I'm going to start the controller again and you will see the evolution of the control error. So let's start again and let's see. And you can see how in real time the error decreases from the value of 1500 pulses to only two pulses over here. Before we start with explanations, we need to explain the main motivation for creating this tutorial. The author of this tutorial has a PhD degree in control theory from the top engineering school in the world. In addition to this, he published a number of papers in prestigious and competitive control engineering journals. Also, he worked on a number of research and industry projects. Finally, he has more than 15 years of university level teaching experience and he was a professor at the reputable schools in the United States of America. Due to this, he is qualified to teach and transfer knowledge about control engineering, robotics, and mechatronics. 
He has observed that online and on popular learning platforms and YouTube, there are a number of tutorials on how to control DC motors using encoders and PAD controllers. Moreover, there are a number of channels on control engineering, robotics, and mechatronics. A large number of these tutorials present an unstructured and incomplete PID control implementation in Arduino. Namely, some PID control implementations that are presented online are based on Kubersum Arduino C style implementation where all the functions and code are placed in a single file. This leads to difficult to understand and Kubersum implementation that is difficult to debug and use in complex projects. Furthermore, the author of this video tutorial has observed that some implementations of the PAD controller presented online are incorrect or incomplete and should not be used in practice. Finally, it is a general impression that some people teaching control online lack the basic knowledge of control theory. The author of this video tutorial has created this particular video tutorial to explain the basics of control algorithms and how to correctly implement control algorithms in practice. In this tutorial, you will learn how to implement the basic PAD control algorithm in disciplined and object-oriented manner, and you will be able to use this code in many different projects. This video tutorial comes with seven C++ code files implementing the encoder class, motor class, and PAD control class, as well as the main C++ code file. In addition to this, this video tutorial comes with this manual explaining how to discretize a PAD controller. And in addition to all this, this video tutorial comes with this manual explaining the wiring diagrams and explaining how to read the data from the encoder. Links to the code files and the manuals are given in the description below this video and in the comment section. And finally, here is the copyright notice. This document, code files, and the lesson video should not be copied, redistributed, or publicly posted on public or private websites or social media platforms. The provided code files and manuals are for the personal use and they should not be posted publicly and or on personal code repositories. The code should not be used for commercial purposes without the explicit permission of the author. The code files and the manual should not be used as a lecture material on online learning platforms and in university courses. This lesson and the provided material should not be used to train an AI algorithm or a large language model. In the sequel, we describe the part list and the wiring diagram. Here is the part list. In this tutorial, we use GA37520 motor with an AB phase incremental HAL encoder. You don't need to use this particular motor. You can use similar motors with HAL effect encoders. The wiring principle will be the same and the motors and encoders will have the same number of pins, only the order of pins might be different. We are using a low-cost DC motor with an integrated HAL effect sensor. There are a number of versions and designs of this DC motor and encoder. You can find these motors on Amazon, eBay, DigiKey, and similar online stores. When it comes to motor driver, we are using L298N motor driver. To repeat, the motor driver is L298N motor driver. This is a low-cost motor driver that can control two motors at the same time. However, you can use any other DC motor driver. You can easily purchase this or similar motor drivers on online stores. Then, when it comes to controllers, we are using Arduino microcontroller. In particular, we are using Arduino Mega. However, you can also use ESP32 or even Tinsy microcontrollers. Next, we explain the motor and encoder wiring diagram. This photo shows the back of the motor. Over here you can see the motor connector. In fact, this is not only the motor connector, this is also the 
encoder connector. This connector contains six pins explained over here. The first pin is the motor plus pin and this pin should be connected to the output one pin of the motor driver. Here's the motor driver and here's the output one pin. Consequently, this pin should be connected to the pin one of this connector. Pin two of this connector is the encoder ground and this pin should be connected to the Arduino ground. Pin three of this connector is the encoder output phase A. This encoder output phase A, that is pin three, should be connected to the Arduino pin two. Here is one very important thing to keep in mind. In our case, Arduino pin 2 is actually the interrupt pin. That is, our board is Arduino Mega and pin 2 is the interrupt pin. It's very important to connect pin 3, that is the output phase A, to the interrupt pin of your Arduino board. If you are using some other board, you should inspect the board schematics and specifications and you should connect output phase A to the interrupt pin. Pin 4 should be connected to the Arduino pin 7. In our case Arduino pin 7 will be programmed as the digital read pin or the digital input pin. Then pin 5 should be connected to the encoder power, or actually this is the encoder power, and should be connected to Arduino 5 volt. Finally, 5.6 is the motor minus pin, and this minus pin should be connected to the output 2 of the motor driver. Here is the output 2 pin of the motor driver. That is, this output 2 pin should be connected to the pin 6 of the motor. Here is the motor driver wiring diagram. First, let's explain these two pins. This first pin should be connected to the power supply voltage. Then, the second pin should be connected to the power supply ground. And at the same time, this pin should be connected to the Arduino ground. If you don't do that, the motor driver should not work properly since the motor driver and Arduino will not have the same ground. Then. Let's explain these pins over here. These pins, these pins over here are used to control the motor direction and the motor angular velocity. The pin called IN3 should be connected to Arduino pin 3. And later on, we will program Arduino pin 3 to, do, to be digital output. Then the pin IN4 should be connected to the Arduino pin 4 and later on we will program Arduino pin 4 to be digital output. Then the pin E and B of our motor driver should be connected to Arduino pin 5 and later on we will program Arduino pin 5 to be digital output. Briefly speaking, the pins IN3 and IN4 that are connected to Arduino pins 3 and 4 will be used to control the motor direction. That is, we will be able to say to the motor driver, spin the motor clockwise or counterclockwise by changing the voltage level sent to the pin 3 and pin 4. On the other hand, this pin E and B that's connected to Arduino pin 5 is the pulse feed modulation pin. That is, we will use this pin to control the angular velocity of our motor or the speed of rotation. We will change the speed of rotation by changing the width of the pulse width modulation signal. And here, we will generate a digital output that will be in the range from 0 to 255. 0 corresponds to no rotation and 255 corresponds to maximum speed of rotation. Then we have these two pins that should be connected to the motor and let's again summarize output 1 pin should be connected to pin 1 of the motor and the output 2 should be connected to the pin 6 of the motor. And that's basically it. Next let's explain the Arduino wiring diagram. In addition to Arduino you will also need a breadboard 
since it's easier to connect all the pins and also you will have to make sure that the Arduino as well as the motor driver and the encoder have the same ground. So let's again summarize everything. Let's start from this pin. Encoder phase A should be connected to Arduino pin 2. And this pin should be a digital interrupt pin. In our case, it is, since we're using Mega board. Then Arduino pin 3 should be connected to the motor driver input 3, whereas motor driver IN3 pin is, it is over here. Then Arduino pin number 4 should be connected to motor driver IN4, that is to this pin over here. Then Arduino pin number 5 should be connected to the motor driver E and B, that is to this pin over here. Then the pin number 7 of Arduino should be connected to the encoder phase B, that is to this pin, to the pin number 4. Then let's continue. The ground should be connected, first of all, here is the ground. The ground should be connected to basically both to the encoder ground and to the motor ground. And this 5 volt should be connected to basically encoder power, that is to the pin number 5 of our motor. To be able to implement the PID control algorithm, we first need to explain how to discretize a PID control method. Over here, I created a manual that explains how to properly discretize the PID controller. A link to this manual will be provided in the description below this video tutorial. Let's start. The first step is to define the control error. The control error denoted by E of t, where t is time, is the difference between y r of t and y of t. Here, y of t is the observed or measured output and y r of t is the desired output. In our case, y of t will be the angle of rotation of the main shaft that is measured by the encoder and y of t will be expressed in pulses detected by the encoder. Pulses are directly proportional to the angle of rotation. On the other hand, in our case, y r of t will be the set point. That is, this will be the desired angle of rotation of the shaft of our motor. That is, if the task is to follow a set point, and this is our case, then y r of t is constant and is called as the set point. The continuous time PID controller has the form given by the equation number 2. In the equation number 2, u of t is the computed control input that is sent to the actuator, e of t is the control error that's defined in this equation, e dot of t is the first derivative of the control error. Kp is the proportional gain parameter. It's called proportional gain parameter since it directly multiplies the error. That is, it's proportional to the error. Ki is the integral gain parameter. It's called the integral gain parameter since it multiplies an integral of the control error. Kd is the derivative gain parameter. It's called the derivative gain parameter since it multiplies the first derivative of the error. The parameters Kp, Ki, and Kd are the control parameters that are selected by the user. And the process of tuning a PID controller consists of selecting the most optimal values of Kp, Ki, and Kd. To implement the PID controller, we need to discretize it. That is, PID controllers are almost never implemented in this continuous time form. In this tutorial, we present a simple approach for discretizing the PID controller. 
There are more advanced and more optimal approaches for discretizing, however, the approach presented in this tutorial is attractive since it is simple and consequently complete beginners can easily understand it. To discretize the PID controller, we need to differentiate this equation over here. By taking the derivative of this equation with respect to time, we obtain the equation number 3. In this equation, u dot of t is the first time derivative of u of t and e double dot is the second time derivative of e of t. The main motivation for taking the first derivative of the continuous time PID control equation is that by the process of differentiation of the PID continuous time equation, we eliminate the integral of the control error and this simplifies the implementation of the PID control algorithm as well as the discretization. We approximate the time derivatives by using the backward Euler finite differences. We use the backward Euler finite differences due to the good stability properties of the backward finite differences in sharp contrast to the forward finite differences. Namely, forward finite differences are not good when it comes to stability properties. The discretization is performed like this. U dot of t is approximated like this. UK minus UK minus 1 over H. Over here, H is a discretization constant or a discretization time step. And UK is defined like this. U with the subscript of K is the control input u at the time instant k multiplying h, where k goes from 0, 1, 2, and 3, and k is called the discrete time step. On the other hand, h is a discretization step or discretization constant that's selected by the user. h can be seen as a tuning parameter of the PID control algorithm. Similarly, we approximate the first derivative of the error as e k minus e k minus 1 divided by h, where again e k is the error at the discrete time instant k multiplying h. Whenever you see k in the subscript, you know that that's a discrete time instant. Then we approximate the second time derivative of the error like this, ek minus 2 multiplying ek minus 1 plus ek minus 2 divided by h squared. If we now substitute the equations 4, 5, and 6 in the equation number 3, we obtain the equation number 7. Then if we multiply the equation number 7 by h, we obtain this equation. Now, if we group the terms multiplying ek, ek minus 1, and ek minus 2, and if we massage this equation, that is, if we group everything, we will obtain this equation. This equation over here can be written compactly, like this, where the constants a1, a2, and a3 are defined over here. These constants depend on the proportional integral and derivative gains. And this equation is very important. We will implement this PAD control equation in discrete time, and we are going to write the C++ code that exactly implements this equation. Let us now analyze and explain this equation. Once the user selects the proportional gain Kp, the integral gain ki, the derivative gain kd, as well as the discretization constant h, we can compute a1, a2, and a3 parameters and store these parameters in the microcontroller memory. Over here, we can see that the control input at the discrete time step k is equal to the control input at the previous time step k minus 1 plus a1 multiplying the control error at the discrete time step k plus a2 multiplying the control error at the discrete time step k minus 1 plus 
A3 parameter multiplying the control error at the discrete time step k minus 2. That is, this equation tells us that the control inputs are computed recursively by propagating this equation over time. To propagate this equation over time, we need to memorize uk minus 1, ek minus 1, and ek minus 2. We don't need to memorize ek since at the time step k, we observe the system's output and we can compute ek. Next, we explain the C++ implementation of the PID control algorithm as well as the C++ implementation of classes that are used to interface motor and encoder with our microcontroller. First, we explain how to write a C++ class that implements an interface between the encoder and the microcontroller. And here is the header file of this class. Whenever you start writing a class, you need to implement these guards. Namely, you need to start your class header file with these two lines, and you need to end the header file with this line. Then, you need to include arduino.h, since we will be using the built-in Arduino functions. And here is the class definition. I call this class encoder class. And here are the public functions and the private member variables. To be able to correctly write the C++ encoder class, we first need to understand the working principle of the encoder. To demonstrate the working principle, I let my motor to spin in the clockwise direction. Then I used an oscilloscope and oscilloscope probes to measure phase A and phase B. Over here, you can see a screenshot of my oscilloscope. The yellow train of pulses represents the phase A. The blue train of pulses represents the phase B. We can observe that when the motor moves or rotates in the clockwise direction, phase B leads phase A. On the other hand, when I let my motor to spin in the counterclockwise direction, the situation changes. Over here, you can observe that the phase A then leads the phase B. That is, when the motor spins in the counterclockwise direction, the phase A will lead the phase B. By detecting and counting these pulses, we can actually determine the angle of rotation as well as the direction of rotation. In the sequel, we are going to implement the encoder class and inside interrupt functions that will be used to count the pulses and that will be used to determine the direction of rotation. So let's start with the implementation. Our encoder class will have the following private member variables. Total pulses, this member variable is used to detect, or better to say, to count the total pulses detected by the encoder. The number of total pulses, that is the value of total pulses, is directly proportional to the angle of rotation. Then we have pin encoder A. This is the Arduino pin to which we attach the phase A. And we have pin encoder B. This is the Arduino pin to which we attach phase B. Here is our constructor. This constructor sets the pin and initializes the pulse count, count to zero. So let's look into the definition of this class. Here it is. Over here you can see the implementation of my functions. And here is the constructor. This constructor will set pin encoder A to pin A, pin encoder B to pin B, and it will set total pulses to zero. Simple as that. Next, I implemented two interrupt functions that are used to count the pulses. The first interrupt function, whose name is count pulses low resolution, is used to count the pulses with low resolution. Let's explain this function. To do that, let's go to the definition of this function. 
here it is. Here's the working principle. This function counts the pulses on every rising edge of phase A. That is, it will count the pulse here, 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 and here. Over here, you need to keep in mind that phase A is attached to the interrupt of the microcontroller. And later on, we are going to set the interrupt such that this function is called on every rising edge of phase A. We have seen previously that if the motor shaft is moving, or better to say rotating clockwise, we are going to have this situation. On the other hand, if the motor shaft is rotating counterclockwise, we are going to have this situation. If the motor is rotating clockwise, then if the rising edge of phase A is detected, phase A will go to high then if we immediately observe phase B, we will see that the phase B will be high. And this happens on the every rising edge of phase A. That is here, here, and here. Whenever we take the measurement of phase B immediately after phase A goes from low to high, we will see that the phase B is high. And this is the situation if our shaft is moving clockwise. On the other hand, let's see what's happening when our shaft is moving counterclockwise. Whenever A goes from low to high, this function will be called, and phase A will be high. However, if we immediately take the measurement of phase B after phase A goes from low to high, we will observe that phase B is low. And this also happens here. Again, phase A goes to high, and if we immediately do digital read of phase B, we will observe that phase B is low. However, phase A is high. And this happens when our shaft moves counterclockwise. From this, we conclude the following. If our shaft is rotating clockwise, then whenever the phase A goes from low to high, and if we immediately check the value of phase B, phase B will be high. That is, if our shaft is moving clockwise, then phase A and phase B will have the same value immediately after the rising edge of phase A. On the other hand, if our shaft is moving counterclockwise, then after the phase A goes from low to high, and if we immediately take the measurement of phase B, phase B will be low. That is, if we take the measurement of phase B immediately after the rising edge of phase A, phase A and phase B will have different values. And this is the indication that we are moving counterclockwise and we can use this principle to count the pulses. And here is the function over here. This function, again, is triggered on every rising edge. And inside of this function, we implicitly know that phase A is high. Then, to check the, if the direction is clockwise, we just need to do digital read of phase B. And if the digital read produces a high value, or better to say, value larger than zero, then we increase the total number of pulses. That is, we are, know that we are moving clockwise and we just increment the total number of pulses. Otherwise, if phase B has a value equal to zero, that is, we know that we are moving in the counterclockwise direction and we decrement or decrease the total value of pulses for one. And that's it. Simple as that. As you will see later on, we are going to register this function. This means that we will tell to Arduino to call this function on every rising edge of phase A. Let's continue. Next, we implemented a function that's used to count the pulses with higher resolution. The name of this function is count pulses high resolution. And let's go to the definition of this function. Here it is. To explain this function, you need to look at this graph over here. 
The idea over here is to count the pulses on both the rising and fall edges of phase A and to call this function on both the rising and fall edges of phase A. Let's analyze the situation when we move clockwise. When we move clockwise and when phase A goes from low to high and if we immediately take the measurement of phase B, we will observe that phase B and phase A have the same high value. On the other hand, when phase A goes to zero and if we immediately take the measurement of phase B, we will observe that phase B and phase A again have the same value. And this is the situation when we move clockwise. That is, by comparing the values of phase A and phase B immediately after either the rising or fall edges of phase A, we can determine if the direction is clockwise and we can consequently count the pulses. Let's see what happens when we rotate counterclockwise. Here's the situation. When the phase A goes from low to high, and if you immediately take the measurement of phase B, we will observe that phase A is high and phase B is low. That is, phase A and phase B have different values. Next, when the fall edge is detected, and if you immediately take the measurement of phase B, we will observe that phase B is high and phase A is low. That is, phase A and phase B have different values. And we can use this principle to detect the counterclockwise movement. That is, if we immediately take the measurement of phase B after either the rising or fall edge of phase A, and if the measurement of phase B is different from the measurement of phase A, this is an indication that we are moving counterclockwise. And this function is actually implementing this principle. Namely, this function is called either on the rising or the fall edges of phase A. And what do we do over here? We simply do digital read of phase B. If the digital read of phase B is different from the digital read of phase A, we know that we are moving in the counterclockwise direction and we simply decrease the value of total pulses. Otherwise, that is, if phase A is equal to phase B, then we increment the pulses, that is, we are moving in the clockwise direction. And that's it. Simple as that. Later on, we will explain how to register this function such that it's called on both the rising and fall edges of phase A. Next, let's continue with the definition of our encoder class. The function initEncoder is used to initialize the encoder pins as well as to register the interrupt function. We need to call this function after calling the default constructor, that is, after calling the encoder class. Let's explain the input parameter. The first input parameter is a pointer to the interrupt function for counting the pulses. Namely, the user will have to give a pointer to either count pulses low resolution or count pulses high resolution, depending on if she or he wants to measure the rotation with high or low resolution. Namely, the main question is, why would you choose high resolution over low resolution. It's logical to always have high resolution. However, the issue over here is that high resolution interrupt function involves more interrupt calls since we are calling the function on both the rising and fall edges as well as more digital reads. And consequently, it's going to consume the computational power of Arduino. And it might introduce some delays and this is especially the case if the shaft moves too fast, then we might not be able to catch up, that is, to properly count the pulses. Consequently, it might be a better option to use this other function, that is, to count the pulses with low resolution. The second input parameter of this function is 
this variable over here, this is an indicator variable which tells to our code if we want to use high resolution or low resolution. That is, you need to specify resolution encoder 1 if you want to use this function or you need to specify resolution encoder 2 if you want to use this function. In fact, you need to specify both the name of the function, or better to say a pointer, and the corresponding number. Let's look at the definition of this function. Here it is. Over here, we register the encoder pins as both the inputs, since we are receiving the values from the encoder, and over here, if resolution encoder is 1, then we register First of all, the interrupt pin. The interrupt pin is always the pin A. Then we register our callback function. In our case, the callback function will be count pulses low resolution. And over here, we are telling to the compiler that we want to call our interrupt function, that is the count pulses low resolution, on every rising edge of phase A. And that's it. On the other hand, if resolution encoder is high, then again, we register the pin A or the phase A to be the interrupt pin. Then we register the callback function. In this case, the callback function will be count pulses high resolution. And we tell to a compiler that we want to call that function on either rising or fall edges of phase A, that is on any change of phase A. And that was the init encoder function. Let's go back to the definition of our encoder class. We only need to define this function. This function is used to return the total pulses. And let's go to the definition. Here it is. We simply return the private member variable total pulses and that's it that's our class here is the class once more this is the first part this is the second part and this is the third part spend some time in order to understand this class and try to implement all these functions by yourself by using the principles i just explained Next, we explain how to write a C++ class for controlling the motor. And here is the header file. We start with the guard and we end the guard. Inside of this class, we need to include Arduino.h since we will be using the built-in Arduino functions. The name of the class is motor class. And before we explain the public and private member variables and functions, let's again look into the wiring diagram of our motor. The pins that we need to focus on are IN3, IN4, and ENB. IN3 will be connected to Arduino pin 3, and this will be digital output pin. IN4 should be connected to Arduino pin 4, and this again is a digital output pin and finally ENB should be connected to Arduino pin 5 and this pin should be also registered as the digital output. These two pins that are connected to Arduino pins 3 and 4 are used to control the directions, namely by sending high and low voltages to these two pins with the different combinations, we will be able to control the directions. We can either move forward or backward, or better to say clockwise or counterclockwise by sending on, off, or off, on the off values. On the other hand, this pin over here, that's, that's actually ENB that's connected to Arduino pin number five, is used to send the pulse width modulation signals. The pulse width modulation signals go from 0 to 255, where 0 means no motion and 255 means move with the highest possible RPMs. Okay, now that we understand this wiring diagram and the purposes of these pins, let's go back to our code. 
private member variables are actually the pin. The first direction pin, here it is, the second one and the third one. These pins are actually this pin, this pin, and this pin. That is, pin 1 in this code should be actually this pin, Arduino pin 3. Pin 2 in the code should actually be pin 4 over here. And motor PWM pin is actually this pin over here. Let's look into the constructor. This constructor sets the motor pins, that is, it sets the direction pins and the PWM pin. And let's look into the definition. Here it is. It simply sets motor direction pin 1 to be equal to the provided value, motor direction pin 2 to be equal to the provided value, as well as the motor PWM pin to be equal to provided value. That's it. Let's proceed. This function is used to register the motor pins and it will stop the motion of the motor. Let's see the definition. Here it is. First of all, we need to register all three pins as the output pins since we will be sending output voltages and we need to turn off the motor. To turn off the motor, we need to send low voltage to pin 1 and pin 2. That is, by looking at this diagram, we conclude that in order to turn off the motor, we need to send low voltage to this pin and low voltage to this pin. Simple as that. Next, let's explain this function for controlling the motor. This function will send the pulse width modulation signal to this pin, that is to the pin motor PWM pin. Let's look at the wiring diagram, that is we are sending the pulse width modulation signals over here. Over here we allow, allow the values to go from minus 255 to 255. Negative values correspond to either clockwise or counterclockwise direction. This is completely up to you. We will see later on my implementation. To see the implementation, let's see the definition. And here it is. First of all, we de declare this variable direction m. Now, if pulse width mo modulation signal is greater or equal greater than or equal to zero, we set the direction to one. Otherwise, we set the direction to 2. If the direction is equal to 1, we are moving in one direction. And what do we do over here? We simply do analog write to this PWM pin, that is, to this pin over here, and we send the absolute value of the provided PWM value. That is, once we compute the absolute value and cast this as unsigned integer 8, the value will be from 0 to 255. Then after we send the value, we actually have to start the motor. To start the motor in this direction, we need to send to motor direction pin 1 high and to motor direction pin 2 low. That is, we need to send to this pin high and to this pin low voltage to move the motor. If we want to move in the other direction, then again, we need to do analog write, the absolute value, and over here we need to adjust the motion. In this case, to pin 3 we are sending low, and to pin 4 we are sending high. And that's it. Simple as that. And that's it. That's our motor class. Here's the first part, here's the second part simple and nothing special. Next, we need to explain the C++ implementation of the PID controller. Here is the header file. Again, we start with the guard and at the end we end the guard. We need to include Arduino.h since we will be using the built-in Arduino functions. 
I call this class as PID control class. First, let's explain the private member variables. The first private member variable is the desired angle. This desired angle is actually the set point. And if you look at this manual for discretizing the controller, the desired angle is yr of t. In our case, this will be a constant value. However, you can modify this code to take into account a trajectory. And I'm calling this private member variable that stores the set point as desired angle. Next, we are having kp, ki, and kd control parameters. These are the proportional control, integral control, and derivative control parameters that correspond to kp, ki, and kd. Note over here that these are the continuous time control parameters. Over here is our discretization constant, and it's expressed in seconds. And if we go down, here's our discretization constant. It is used to discretize the system, and I'm calling it as h, also in my code. Here are the discrete time errors and control parameters. Here is error at the time instant k. That is the error at the time instant k. Here is the error at the time instant k minus 1. That is ek minus 1. Then here is the error at the time instant k minus 2. That is ek minus 2. Here is the control signal at the time instant k, that is uk. The PID control algorithm will actually compute control k and then we will send control k to the motor driver. And here is control k minus 1, that is uk minus 1. Here are the parameters a1, a2 and a3. The parameters a1, a2 and a3 are defined over here and they will be set by the constructor. Okay, let's continue. Let's explain the functions. First of all, here is the constructor. The constructor accepts the continuous time control parameters, kp, ki, kd, as well as the delay p. Now over here, I explained to mention one last control parameter, which I didn't actually, it's actually the discretization constant, which I also call as a delay. And this delay <clears throat> will be stored in H. Next, let's go to the definition of our constructor. Here it is. The constructor will set the desired angle to zero. Then it will set the values of the proportional control, integral control, and derivative control parameters, it will set the delay value. And then it will set error at the time instant k, k minus 1, and k minus 2 to 0, as well as the control input at the time instant k, and k minus 1 to 0. Then it will compute the parameters a1, a2, a3, that is, over here, we are simply implementing these equations. And you can see a1 over here, kp plus ki multiplying h plus kd over h. You can see a2 minus kp minus 2 multiplying kd over h. And you can see a3 kd over h. Simple as that. Nothing special. Let's continue. This function is used to initialize the PID controller. To initialize the PID controller, we need to provide two things. First of all, we need to provide the desired angle, or better to say, our set point, and the actual measurement of the angle expressed in the pulse count. That is, we need to provide DA, which will be our set point, and the angle measurement. The angle measurement will be actual measurement obtained by the encoder. And let's look in, into definition. Here it is. We set the desired value of the angle. And over here, we initialize the error based on the desired angle or basically on the basis of the set point. 
and on the basis of the angle measurement. And what do we over what do we do over here? We simply say that ek minus one is equal to ek and ek minus two is equal to ek. That is, in this initialization step, we need to set the initial conditions. And over here, I'm telling to my controller that the errors at the previous time steps are equal to the current error. That's it. Simple as that. Of course, there is more optimal way of performing initialization. However, in the interest of time and in the interest of making this code relatively short, I'm not going to implement the second approach. Next, this function is used to compute the control action. That is, it's used to compute the pulse width modulation control action. The computed control action is in the interval from minus 255 to 255. And this control action is actually sent to motor control function, which controls the motor. Okay. So let's go back here and let's look into the definition of this function. Here it is. This function accepts as the input the actual measurement. That is the output of the system, or better to say, the pulses detected by the encoder. Then we compute EK. That is, we compute the value over here. EK is the set point minus the actual measurement. And over here, we print the error in order to keep track of everything. Then what do I do over here? Namely, if your controller is working, 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 and it reaches a small value <clears throat> of the error, you might see a jitter effect. That is, the controller might produce oscillation of the main shaft. That's why it's a good idea to stop the encoder once the error falls below a certain value. In my case, I set three encoder pulses. These three encoder pulses are actually a fraction of a degree, a very small fraction of the degree. You can play with this parameter to increase it or decrease it. If this happens, I simply turn off my control. Otherwise, if the control error is below this tolerance, I'm doing control. And over here, you can see the implementation of my control equation. Here it is. So let's read uk is equal to uk minus 1 plus a1 multiplying ek plus a2 multiplying ek minus 1 plus a3 multiplying ek minus 2. And that's it. Simple as that. One line of code. Now, what can happen is that this control k might be relatively large. That is, it might go over 255 or it might fall below minus 255. Or if we compute the absolute value of control k, the absolute value is above 255. However, our actuator can only produce pulse width modulation signals from 0 to 255 where we don't count the sign. The sign is just the direction. To deal with this problem, we can use several methods. The simple possible method is to add the limits. And here we are saying if the control is above 255, set the control to 255. If the control is below negative minus 255, that is if the absolute value is still larger than 255, we set the control to minus 255. And honestly speaking, this is not the most optimal method for limiting the control values. In practice, people like to implement an integral anti-windup filter. And this type of filter will automatically decrease the control value to be inside of these limitations. In my next video tutorial, I will explain to how, how to do that. However, for the time being, you can even use this relatively simple approach to limit the value of the control input. Once we are done, we need to update the values for the next iteration. We are saying that ek minus 1 is equal to actual error, that is the current error, then ek minus 2 is equal to ek minus 1, 
or better to say I have to correct myself here the control at the time instant k minus 1 becomes the control at the time instant k we are simply shifting shifting the time index then the error at the time instant k minus 2 becomes the error at the time instant k minus 1 and the error at the k minus 1 becomes equal to the current error and that's it and finally we just return the current value or the computed value of the control input and that's it simple as that and that's the PID control class nothing special of course we can significantly improve this class by adding an anti-winder filter also we can do filtering of the control error error we can do filtering of the measurement and we can even do some other fancy things that I will not explain in this video tutorial in order not to make this video tutorial to last for 10 hours and here's the main file for controlling the motor first of all we need to include our encoder class header file motor class header file and the PID control header file next we need to set the motor pins here we say that motor input 3 is 3, motor input 4 is 4, and motor enable is 5. And that's it. Simple as that. Now if you look at the wiring diagram, here I just said this pin is 3, this pin is 4, and this pin is 5. Next we need to set the encoder pin. Encoder A is 2 and encoder B is 7. And that's precisely what you can see over here, 2 and 7. Over here, I'm specifying the set point or the reference point. I'm assuming 1,500 pulses. You can transform these pulses to angles if you calibrate, for example, your encoder. That is, you can measure how many pulses you have for 360 degrees of rotation of your encoder and you can actually specify the angle in degrees, not in pulses. Over here, I'm specifying the PID control parameters. It took me some time to manually tune my PID controller and these PID control parameters might not work perfectly in your case. That is, you need to tune the PID controller by yourself depending if you have, for example, some inertia attached to your motor or a wheel or a longer pendulum or something heavy. That is, be careful and don't use blindly my PID control parameters. Try to tune your PID controller. Over here, I need to specify the discretization constant. This is actually delay in our code. Then, I need to initialize the control action this is the value that will be computed by the PID controller. Then I need to create my PID control object. I'm calling it PID controller. I'm specifying proportional integral derivative gain as well as the discretization constant. Here is my encoder object. And here for illustration, I use pointers and this keyword new to create my encoder object just to illustrate how you can actually do differently things I'm passing encoder A and encoder B pins that is 2 and 7 and over here I'm creating an object for controlling the motor I'm registering the pins motor in 3 motor in 4 and enable that is 3 4 and 5 here is my setup function I'm starting serial, I'm initializing my motor, this will actually register the pin and turn off the motor, then I'm introducing some delay for this effect to take into account, that is, I will probably need some time for the motor to stop or something similar, so introduce some delay over here, or you can even go with, let's say, one second. To mention when you specify delays, delay is in milliseconds. That is 1000 corresponds to one second. So let's save this. And over here I'm registering 
the resolution of my encoder, I'm saying that I want to measure with low resolution. And to do that, you need to use this syntax. This syntax is a syntax for lambda functions, and I will explain lambda functions in my future video tutorials. If, for example, you want to use high resolution, then you need to uncomment this line. And don't forget, let me just save this. Here, there was an error. This should be two over here. And what is very interesting to observe over here is also that you need to specify one for low resolution or two for high resolution. And then over here, wait some time. That is, introduce some delay for this registration to take, take effect. And here we are. Over here, we initialize our PID controller. We specify the desired angle. That is the value of 1,500 pulses. And over here, I'm performing the initial measurement. To get the, the measurements from the encoder, I'm calling encoder1, then this arrow, get pulse count. Here, I need to use arrows since encoder is actually a pointer. And you cannot use dot. And here's my main loop. Look how short it is. It's actually one, two, three lines of code. And that's the power of the object-oriented programming. If you embed all the drivers, all the classes that establish that are establishing the interface between your controller, your motor, and your encoder, then the main code becomes relatively simple and easy to debug. So what do I do over here? I'm calling compute control action and I'm passing the current value of the angle. That is the encoder measurement. Then what will happen over here? Let's see. Let's go to compute function. Here it is. This function will compute the control action. Here it is and it will return the value. Simple as that. And the value will be stored over here. The value will go from minus 255 to plus 255. Then I'm simply passing this value to my motor control function. Let's go to the definition of this function. This function will accept this value. We'll look at the sign of the value to see if it's positive or negative in order to adjust the direction. And then once the direction is being determined, it will simply do analog write and send the corresponding value. And that's it. And then over here, we are introducing delay such that we respect the discretization and such that we control the system every H time steps. And I have to mention here one very important thing. Here you can actually deviate from this delay. You can increase or decrease this delay to better tune your controller. Okay, that's it. Simple as that. Nothing special. So if I now run everything, it will run perfectly. However, before you run, you have to make sure the two things are properly being set. The first thing is that your Arduino is connected to your system. And second of all, is to make sure that everything here is correct. Now what you hear in the background is the motor actually falling from the, uh, my table. However, I'm fixing it is now since it was unstable and that's always problematic. So always keep in mind that if you're spinning this motor that can produce a significant amount of torque, the motor can flip or something can happen. That's another thing to worry about. So let me go back over here and let's see under tools, you have to make sure that your communication port is properly set and that your board is also properly set. Once you do that, you need to upload the code. If I now upload the code, the motor will start spinning, as you can hear over, see over here, and over here you can see the final control error on my serial monitor. You can see that the control error is actually only one pulse. Now, what you can do, you can play with the parameters over here because you can see that if the absolute value falls below 3, that is if the absolute value of the 
error falls below 3, the controller will stop. So you can play with this parameter. For example, you can specify 10 over here. You can upload. Then you will reach your destination faster, however, with less accuracy. And then here it is. It's less accurate. You can see that the final value of the error is around 6. Okay, that's all for today. I hope that you like this video. If you like the videos I'm creating, please press the like and subscribe buttons and see you in the next